Good evening, and welcome to the 17th annual Nanotechnology and Engineering Symposium here at North Bend High School. Yeah, it's... We are so excited for you to be here tonight to take a look at the work that the students have been doing this year. It's a blessing for me every day to sit in the lab and work with them, um, to be inspired by them, to, be, to work with them as colleagues, not just as teacher-student, but as colleagues, because we are doing some new stuff that is not typically found in the average high school classroom. It is really exciting, so I feel blessed to be a part of this and can't wait to share the work that these students have done with you. So we have 51 students in the engineering design and development course and 17 research teams, all with different threads of research in environment, healthcare, energy, efficiency, many other different venues that they've taken that we're gonna share with you this evening. And uh, I'm really excited for us to be able to take a look at the different things that we have. Now, before we get started, I wanna give you a little bit of a background about the information that you're gonna to hear tonight, because you're gonna hear terms like polyvinylidene fluoride and polyethylene dioxythiophene polystyrene sulfonate. And what does that mean, right? So I'm gonna give you just a little bit of background, but only take a few minutes, because we do have a lot of research that I wanna share, and I want these students to be able to share with you. But if we take a look, our program here at North Penn is split into two parts. We have the Engineering Academy, and we have the Technology and Engineering Education Department. I myself am a graduate from North Penn in 1992. My door hinge is what I refer to as the teacher who showed me that teaching is the way to go and I would never do anything else in my entire life because I feel blessed to be here every day. Uh, Mr. Bob Bateman introduced me to teaching and I fell in love with it and went to Millersville and got my undergraduate degree. And so I came back and started teaching here in 99 and I was teaching all the courses that you can see on the right and primarily I was teaching electronics. But you can see on the left, we also have an engineering academy. Now, how did that start? Well, in 1999, I was part of a team uh, to take a look at bringing engineering to North Penn High School. We graduate 1,000 students a year, many of whom go on to engineering, but have never stepped foot into an engineering course. So our purpose in our department was like, well, we gotta change that. We gotta give these students opportunity to take a look at what engineering is. It's much more than driving a train, right? We're actually learning how to solve the problems of humanity which is really exciting. And so you can see on the right-hand side the eight different courses that we offer now in our engineering academy, and on the left-hand side, all the different clubs and activities that we also run here. Because our program is all about opening doors for our students. I referred to Mr. Bob Bateman as the teacher of my senior year, who I call my door hinge. And my purpose on this planet is to be a door hinge for your children, my students. And so I'm really excited that this program is gonna offer these opportunities for them. So th these students are in the senior capstone course of our engineering academy called Engineering Design and Development. In EDD, they take a look at a six-step engineering design process. Some universities use more, but we use um, six steps and each one goes through defining what the problem is all the way down to presenting. So if you look at step six, that's what these guys are gonna be doing this evening, which I'm really excited about. So when I take a look at scientists discover the world that is engineers, create the world that has never been created before. And you're gonna hear a lot of new endeavors being taken today. These students are riding the edge of engineering, and I get to take a ride with them, which is so exciting. So my first introduction to nanotechnology, because it's like, all right, we have engineering, but where did nanotechnology at North Penn come from? Well, first thing is, we're the only high school that I know of that's doing this type of research. We're very lucky to have the experiences that we've had. And I signed up for a summer research program in 2003. Um, a, a called Research Experience for Teachers at Drexel University. I worked with Dr. Frank Coe, who is now at the University of British Columbia, and he introduced me into nanotechnology. And he shared with me this paper. He's like, Mike, read this paper. We're gonna talk about this when you come in. And I read it and went, uh-oh. I had no clue what anything meant. This was in 2003, nanotechnology was coming out, and it was, it's been around, but not mainstream, and I'm like, I don't know, and I told my wife, and she's like, no, you gotta do this. How would your students feel if, you, if they turned away an opportunity? I'm like, you're right, <laughs> you're okay, honey. And so I took that opportunity, and all of a sudden, I learned about something, a field of science called materials engineering, and got really versed in the background of materials science, and took a look at how engineers can apply forces to materials to change their properties. 
Like for example, mechanical force. You can hit something with a hammer, right? But did you know that light is a force? You can shine a light on an object and change its properties. Take a look at what happens when you're out in the sun too long, you get a skin burn, right? That's from the sun, it's light energy, and it's an energy traveling in a specific type of waveform. So these students are learning how to apply forces to materials to change them. And when we try new properties and new materials and new forces, we come up with new novel ways, which ties in the next part of our work, and that's in the nanotechnology side. Because not only do we apply forces to materials, but we change the materials that we apply the forces to. Because now when you make something smaller, it behaves differently, completely. All of a sudden, it's melting temperature changes, it's color changes. There's a multitude of other facets that are so exciting when you work at the nanoscale that open up the door to scientists that we realize, my gosh, we only know about 10% of what physics really has to offer us. Because when we work at the nanoscale, everything changes. It's like the periodic table of elements is three-dimensional. That's insane, which is really exciting. Um, so you could take a look at you know, nanotechnology itself is the crea creation of functional materials, materials that do things, and systems through the control of matter on the nanometer length scale. Now, to give you a heads up, visible light travels in waveforms, and the space between each waveform is somewhere between 400 and 700 nanometers. So you, you can't see that, but so we know that a nanometer is really small, it's a billionth of a meter. So you could take a look at various different things. Even a, a red blood cell is three to 5,000 nanometers. So you don't see individual cells. So these students are working in things that could be 300 nanometers, 500 nanometers. It's insane. So how, how do we do that? How are they applying it? And one of the things that some of the teams are working with is a process called electrospinning. Electrospinning creates fabric, like your shirt, like cloth, like a tissue. But we functionalize that fabric. And what we do is we take a polymer solution, we take a high voltage power supply, zero to 30,000 volts, 160 microamps, so real small. Your cell phone battery has more wattage than this. We use various different polymers, like I'd mentioned earlier, uh, PEO, which is polyethylene oxide, PMMA, polymethyl methacrylate, uh, PCL, polycaprolactone, polyvinyl pyrilidone, polyvinylidene fluoride. We work with different polymers and we functionalize them in this electrospinning process. So when we put this, these polymers in a liquid solution, put them in a needle, we apply a high voltage to it, we cause these fibers to jet out and create super small fabric that we now can say, well, let's touch it and make it make voltage when we apply a pressure, convert mechanical energy into electrical. It's really exciting, so you'll see that. The students learn how to prepare polymers and they go through the actual electrospinning process of making these nanofibers and they'll talk about this this evening when we go through. So what can you do with these nanofibers? You can make air filters, water filters. We can make artificial nerves. There's a multitude of different things that we can do, and you're going to hear about them tonight. And for example, if we're working at the nano scale, smaller than the wavelength of light, your traditional optical microscopes don't work. We have to use an electron microscope. And that's where you can see students here working on an electron microscope that we have on uh, loan from Hitachi, Hitachi High Tech America. It's insane. It's absolutely amazing that we have vision with this piece of equipment. And so you can see some of the examples of the images that students have taken. And we'll talk more when we go to the auxiliary gym this evening. Something else that I wanted to make sure I made mention to is that the North Penn Educational Foundation here in our district is the only reason why we can do what we do every year. They single-handedly support us financially to give us our research funding to make the things happen for all that we do. Uh, so we're very, very thankful for all that they do for us. And speaking of donations and things like that, you could take a look at all the companies we've done. So from 2003 when I started learning about nanotechnology to 2005 when I started writing curriculum and writing for grants to actually starting the program The Future is Near, Nanotechnology Education and Research in 2005-2006 school year, since then we are in year 17 of research. It's absolutely amazing to be along for the ride and I'm so blessed because these students are standing on the shoulders of giants before them, which is absolutely amazing. So when we look at what we did in 2005, what are polymers? What is electrospinning? And now we look at today, they're standing on the shoulders of giants with, can we harvest energy from rain, from wind, from typing, the mechanical pressure on keyboards? How do we make fuel cells more efficient? And a multitude of other things you're gonna hear about tonight. So I'm really excited to share the evening with you and have my students share their work with you as well. So at this time, I'd like to hand it off to our first team and thank you very much.
Thank you, Mr. Boyer, for the wonderful introduction. My name is Owen Marcus. I'm Cody Froshauer. And I'm Jake Sparrow. And we are Polycable Industries. Cabling is used all around the world in major industries, but even though it's common, it has many shortcomings, one of them being corrosion. Though cabling is produced with a galvanized coating, making it weatherproof, that coating will eventually wear off, leading to the cable to corrode. Another issue is microfractures. Microfractures are not much of a problem they occur on the outer wires, but if they occur on a core wire, it could lead to the wire decreasing about 20% in structural integrity. One of the more common failures is bird caging. Bird caging occurs when the outer wires of the cable itself twist against the grain of it. This will lead to the rope failing. To surpass some of these shortcomings, we decided to do research on plenty of materials. We found that ultra-high molecular weight polyethylene, specifically Dyneema, was our best option. Unfortunately, we couldn't test this due to its caustic natures and expense. Therefore, we decided to electrospin polyethylene oxide. We chose polyethylene oxide because it shared many characteristics with other high strength polymers. Now, instead of using a typical collection plate, we decided to use a large rotating disc, which would ultimately produce longer and more lined polymer strands. After we would electrospin, we would then carefully peel off the polymer from our disc and we would store it away for later analysis. After this, we would then use the scanning electron microscope in order to analyze the alignment of the fibers as well as other unique characteristics of each spin. The basis of our research was to increase tensile strength of polymers. But first, we need to create a foundation for our testing so it could be replicable. As you can see here, we have two spins, spin one and spin seven, and under the SEM, they proved to be very similar. Our first variable that we wanted to change was the distance from our syringe pump to the collection plate. As you can see, our 10 centimeter spin was a lot more congealed and messy, making it more of a uh, less wanted spin. As you can see, our 12 centimeter spin came out to be very aligned and separated. Okay, so to continue. To continue our research, we then moved to the Mark 10 tensile tester. This machine is used to measure the strength and tensile properties of each polymer. So for our research, we would put our polymers into the C clamps of the Mark 10 and use preset testing parameters to run our polymers until they would fail. So as you can see, these are the graphs that we got from our Mark 10. We have an 8 centimeter test, a 10 centimeter test, and a 12 centimeter test. So as you can see, our eight centimeter test did the best with producing a max load capacity of 1.9 newtons while only weighing 0 0.005 grams. If we had more time to experiment, we would spin with a multitude of different polymers and or try and mix them. We'd also want to use different layers to see if we could prevent corrosion. We also would like to try different types of collection plates. And we, will, we would want to use different techniques, such as braiding, in order to obtain the maximum strength. Thank you for your time. Off to Aquaflow. Hello everyone, I'm Caleb Yanagawa. I'm Sajid Zahid. I'm Tyler Efford. I'm Garrett Chanko. And we are Aquaflow Filtration. Nowadays, over 99% of America has access to clean water. But did you know that over one fourth of the total population does not have a sustainable access to a clean and drinkable water source? We at Aquaflow search for a way to produce low cost filters for underprivileged regions of the world. The Life Straw is a portable filter that allows the user to drink directly from a contaminated water source. The picture on the left shows a cross section of the filter showing the fibers of the filter. And the picture on the right is an SEM image showing the pores of a singular fiber of the filter. 
The Vontron reverse osmosis membrane is efficient in removing particles and even heavy metals and minerals from water. The picture in the bottom left shows the wound up layers of the filter and the picture on the right shows the pores of the main filtration layer. The three polymers that we chose were PCL, PMMA, and PVDF. We chose these polymers based off the strength and the individual spacing between these fibers. The first experiment we performed on these fibers was a contact angle test. This test would show us if these polymers were hydrophobic or hydrophilic. P PCL and PVDF, oh, PCL and PMMA turned out to be hydrophobic with PCL having a contact angle of 123.5, which was about 18 degrees higher than PMMA. PVDF was the opposite, where instead of creating a, a bead on the top of the fiber, it absorbed the water. After the hydrophobicity test, we were able to spin some polymers on an aluminum foil or aluminum screen. Uh, with doing so, the P PCL was in a grid-like form, the PMMA was in a spider web form, and the PVDF was in a, uh, was in like that form because the water on top was not sticking with the water. This is our device we have made and designed. Uh, we have found, we have made a polymer holder to test the water and the turbidity of the water to see if it would clean from dirty to clean. With doing so, we've made a pump as well that will pump zero to five PSI for it to pump clean water. On the left is the image of our electrospun PCO under the SCM before we put in our prototype. On the right are the after results. The PCO fibers were strong and able to withstand water pressure, filtering out debris from the dirty water. The PCO filtered the water to the point where the fibers got clogged almost instantly. PMMA was a second polymer that we tested. PMMA had filtration properties, but underperformed as a whole compared to PCL due to the poor arrangement of the fibers on our aluminum screen. PVDF was our third and final polymer. This polymer was not able to pass water through the fibers due to an error in the electric spinning process as seen in the before image. The results from these experiments were promising. Out of the three, PCL was the only polymer that could, that could have a place in the filtration industry. PCL was able to reduce the turbidity of the dirty water by 67.6%. The only problem with PCL was how fast it got clogged. The next step in our development process would be making a multi-stage filter using the PCL polymer. We would use varying screen sizes to prevent the blockage that occurred in our initial testing. Thank you for your time, and off to the great gentleman over at eForce. Good afternoon, everyone. My name is Ralph Islam. I'm Shakib Hassan. I'm Brian Blanco. And we're eForce. 3.9 trillion kilowatt hours. This is how much electricity the US uses in a single year. And it kind of demonstrates how much electricity is important to our society and way of life. 60% of our electricity was created by fossil fuels in 2021, as opposed to only 20% being made by renewable resources. The issue with this is fossil fuels harm our environment. So we wanted to work on a uh, so we wanted to work on a renewable resource that could help. Current solutions we have are such as solar, wind, and hydropower, but we wanted to work on thermoelectrics, which we think is underutilized using TEGs. So what is a TEG? The TEG or a thermoelectric device is a device that can create a voltage by using he by using heat difference by moving neutrons and protons from the hot side to the cold side of two pieces of ceramic. So for all of our experiments, we used a heat sink and a cooling fan to cool the one side. On the other side was a resistor bank was, that was our added heat source. And in between the tag and the resistors is where we placed our added polymer to help the efficiency of the tag. 
The polymer we chose was polyvinyl pyrrolidone because of its high melting point and large surface area. We also created two solutions with copper and diamond at 20%. We collected our data through veneer sensors, collecting the hot and cold side temperature, the temperature difference, and uh, the voltage generated out the tank. We started off with the basic characterization of the TEG to understand its limits. We then used the polymer PVP and tested both sides, side A and side B. We were able to get higher results on side A. Side B did not give us great results as it acted as a heat blanket, it didn't let the heat transfer. We then incorporated PVP with copper nanoparticles and were also able to get great results on side A. But again, on side B, it acted as a thermal blanket. Our final experiment was PVP incorporated with diamond nanoparticles, and unfortunately, we did not get as high results as we expected. Overall, our, our best experiment was PVP incorporated with copper nanoparticles. We were able to get a temperature difference of 111 degrees Celsius and a power out of 11.9 milliwatts. So if we had more time, we would have enjoyed to have done more experiments. Some of, the ex uh, some of these experiments would have been using a different heat source, such as a car motor, and seeing while the car is driving, how much power can we get out of it? Using different polymers or nanoparticles that we could use to see how they would react to heat and how it would transfer more, about, um, if it would transfer better. And lastly, we would have wanted to integrate the polymers directly onto the TEG, as we had to use aluminum foil to transfer it onto the TEG due to some limitations we had. With that, we'd like to thank you for your time and move it on to the next team, Process X. Good evening, ladies and gentlemen. My name is Scott Klein. I'm Tim Schwar. And I'm Ryan Wolliver. And we are Process Sex. Every person that has used a computing device before has seen a loading screen like this or something similar to this. Imagine if you never had to see this again while also increasing the overall output of your device. It is no secret that this is an issue we face. However, most people don't realize that the problem stems from the thermal interface material. Thermal interface materials, otherwise known as TIMS, are a substance that goes between the processor and the respective heat sink in order to transfer the heat effectively. This year, our team researched uh, the problem of computers overheating and enduring crippling damage due to the poor TIMS. Current solutions to TIMS have been thermal pads and graphite, graphite pads, and a substance known as thermal paste, as shown on the picture on the left. It's being applied to the processor, and then the heat sink gets placed on top of that, and the substance thermal paste transfers the heat in between. Our solution was to create Tim out of a polymer called polyvinyl pyrrolidone, or PVP for short. We dissolved the PVP in deionized water and added various different my, uh, nanoparticles to improve the thermal conductivity. We then electrospun this solution to create our own TIM. On the left is our TIM applied to a heat sink, and on the right is an image of our nanofibers under the SEM. The white patches, as seen in the image, are copper nanoparticles encased in PVP solution. We then ran the computer and in the operating system checked to see if the processor temperatures were safe enough for us to run the computer without damaging the processor. The image on the left with 89 degrees Celsius is an example of unsafe temperatures that could damage the processor. And the image on the right is the two programs we used, one being Cinebench is what we use to throttle the processors to maximum loadage. And the image, I mean the program on the right is MSI Afterburner, which we use to plot the temperature over time. Here are the baseline tests we ran. Those being no thermal interface material and the graphite pad. We are comparing the rate of change of temperature, which is represented by the slope of the best fit line. Basically, the lower the slope, the better. This graph shows our tests compared to the baselines. We also ran pure PVP fibers. However, they acted as a blanket and trapped heat on the processor, which made it too hot to run anything safely. 
We then moved on to copper additives, which performed better than the graphite pad. However, when we were electrospinning, we were unable to record the time that we electrospun for, which makes the relative thickness unknown. This became an issue when we moved into diamond, which performed shockingly bad, which we believe is due to the layer being too thin. If we had more time, we would rerun our copper experiment to find the time that we electrospun for. We would then use that time with the diamond particles to see how the thickness affected our initial diamond test. And then we would test our solution in applications outside of just processors. Thank you for your time, and now on to solar transparency. Good evening, my name is Jessica Beck. I'm Veronica Ott. I am Charlotte Patterson. I'm Kaylee Spencer and we are Solar Transparency. The sun provides us with 10,000 times more energy than we would need to power the entire planet. This means that if we could harness just 0.01% of the sun's full potential, we could power everything on only solar energy. However, current solar panels don't make this practical. The current option for consumers is the roof mount solar panel, and these are only 15 to 18 percent efficient. Only one percent of the world's energy consumption is from solar energy. This lack of efficiency, combined with their high initial costs and slow return on investment, and their unappealing design, discourage consumers from switching to solar, and more research is needed to improve their feasibility. We determined that the best base design to model our solar cell after would be a dye-sensitized solar cell. A DSSC is a low-cost photovoltaic cell that absorbs visible light and converts it into electrical energy. The cell is comprised of five different layers, a conductor, semiconductor, electrolyte, photosensitizer, and counter-electrode. The electrolyte allows the electrons that are harvested by the photosensitizer to flow through the cell where they are where, where they are converted into electrical energy and voltage. After gaining a better understanding of a dye-sensitized solar cell, we decided to build our own DSSC based off the past research team's experiment. We used conductive glass slides made from indium tenoxide and semiconductive titanium dioxide paste. Then we crushed blackberries and kale to accumulate dye for our photosensitizer. We use a liquid potassium iodide solution as our electrolyte, and we use candles to burn a carbon soot layer onto our glass for our counter electrode. To effectively work towards our goals, we decided to improve our solar cell one layer at a time. We first focused on our titanium dioxide layer. The previous team had painted the paste onto the glass, but we found that this was too uneven and too opaque. So to improve on these issues, we decided to spin coat the titanium dioxide directly onto the glass. We used a centrifuge device to spin the glass slides at 3,000 RPM, while we injected the titanium dioxide with the syringe to create a uniform covering. We found that with this method, we got better results. The biggest problem with the DSSC in our preliminary experiment was the use of the liquid electrolyte. The liquid would dry over time and its efficiencies would deteriorate. With further research, we found that solid state electrolytes were being used in other DSSC applications, but were unfeasible in the lab due to the toxic chemicals needed to be used. Similarly to the previous team, we used um, potassium iodide and embedded it into our PEO solution and created a polymer electrolyte. With this electrolyte, we spun this onto the conductor side of the ITO glass and found that the polymer electrolyte's results were replaceable with the liquid electrolyte and its efficiencies would have deteriorated over time. In order to test our DSSCs, we needed a light source that would be able to serve as a constant variable in place of the sun. To accomplish this, we used full spectrum infrared and ultraviolet LEDs to create a light source that successfully met solar testing standards. As shown by the graph, 
our light was able to accurately replicate the sun with a lower transmittance percentage. On the screen, you can see the results from all of our experiments from this year. These are the open circuit voltages of each of the solar cells that we made. You can see that while the kale brought us closer to transparency, the blackberry dyed slides with the anthocyanin brought us much higher open circuit voltages. You can also see from our first experiment to our last, we were able to increase the open circuit voltage from 472 millivolts to 484 millivolts. This final experiment also included our two successfully improved layers with the spin-coated titanium dioxide semiconductor and our spin-coated solid-state polymer electrolyte. If there was more time, we would work towards improving the DSSC's overall efficiency and transparency, replacing the carbon set layer with an electrospun platinum layer, platinum being more conductive and electrospinning allowing more light to pass through as it would create even thinner layers. We would also work towards replacing the anthocyanin berry layer, which we had done throughout the year, replacing it with the kale, but found that the much darker anthocyanin layer had higher efficiencies. We would, thank you, we would like to thank you all for coming out tonight and welcome Solar to the stage. Good evening, ladies and gentlemen. I'm Mohamed Hoek. I'm Justin Yelders. I'm Nicholas Di Maria. And I'm Aiden Hoy. And we are Solar Genix. To start off, how many of you have a vehicle? Can I see a show of hands? That's a lot of vehicles just alone in this room. Now, keeping this in mind, there's estimated to be 1,450,000,000 vehicles in the world. Now, imagine if every single vehicle was able to capture the sun's wasted energy, pushing back the energy to power your homes around the country. This can not only save families' cost of energy, but also combat against greenhouse gases that commence our climate change. A product currently on the market in relation to our research is Tesla's at-home solar power wall. The idea of Tesla's power wall is for a solar panel to be embedded on top of a home to collect solar energy, which then pushes it to the power wall. After charged, Tesla's power wall acts as an exterior generator for your home. We would like to take this idea and mobilize it. We would like to put our own solar panels and our own power wall inside vehicles to collect solar energy while you're out driving, sitting at home in your driveway, or even in a parking lot somewhere. The energy will then be brought back to your home, which can then be, the, your home can then be powered by your vehicle. This will ultimately maximize the use of wasted solar energy. The design process was broken down into five main parts. We had the solar panel, the battery charger, the battery, an inverter, and a way to push the energy we harvested into a place where it can be utilized. The first step of our endeavor is the solar panel. We first needed to characterize the solar panel to figure out how it harvests the sun's energy. In this picture, you can see a solar cell that we use to create a characterization process to measure things like power seen on the graph. In this picture, you can see our Keithley source meter that we used to characterize all of our solar panels and measure power seen on the graph. With this meter, we can measure open circuit voltage, short circuit current, power, maximum voltage and maximum current. We ran two experiments on storing the energy in a battery, as presented as the two pictures on the screen. The first experiment, the photo on the left, consists of our solar panel and a device that channeled our solar energy into a 3.7 volt battery. Our second experiment, the photo on the right, consists of a, a larger and more efficient solar panel alongside a 12 volt battery to store additional energy, as well as a top solar monitor to prove that our experiment works. Let's take a deeper dive into why we needed the inverter. We needed to take the DC current from the battery and transform it into AC current to get the current used by households and the power grid. We researched and found a schematic and built it on a breadboard using resistors, transistors, and a transformer. We were also able to get a more advanced inverter when we upgraded the rest of our equipment. We measured the efficiency of the inverters based off of the ratio of DC to AC current. We were able to get a ratio of just under 10 to 1 with the homemade inverter and a ratio of just over 10 to 1 with the new inverter. If we had more time, we would have liked to find out how to do wireless charging or inductive charging. The idea would be to 
embed solar panels into the car and after harvesting energy all day, be able to push that energy into the house or power grid wirelessly. Another way we looked into expanding our research is the creation of transparent solar cells as explained by a previous group. Instead of putting big bulky solar panels on top of vehicles, we look to embed these transparent cells into the paints of the vehicles to ultimately create a visually appealing but yet still effective product. Thank you for your time. We would like to welcome up the next group, Aquatech. Good evening, my name is Logan Tripler. And I'm Thomas Samalowicz. And we're Aquatech. 880 million people worldwide do not have access to clean drinking water. And of those 880 million, 3.6 million die of waterborne illnesses every year. This is a problem because current solutions are too expensive and inaccessible. So we needed to create a new solution that was cheap and efficient. The first thing we wanted to learn was how to electrospin, because we originally had the idea of electrospinning an antibacterial fiber for our filter. We ended up not having enough time for this. At the start of our research, Mr. Boyer had bought us the zero water filters, which we used to compare to our own materials and data. One of the first things we did with a zero water filter is we, We analyzed its components and compared it to the uh, sediments that we plan to use for our own filter. We chose six different sediments for our filter. We chose diatomaceous earth, activated charcoal, fine and large grain sand, and fine and large grain gravels. We chose this, uh, these sediments because of their physical and chemical properties. We ended up creating three different designs for our filter, with the first two not working at all and polluting our samples. And the third design we landed on did work in filtering water. To test the efficiency of our water, we poured uh, contaminated water, which was water mixed with soil in our filter. On the left is the contaminated water, and on the right is the water after being filtered. We measured our results in four different ways, with the first one being turbidity. And turbidity is a measurement of water clarity, which is measured in nephilometric turbidity units. As you can see on the graphs, after being filtered, the tur uh, turbidity rating dropped by about 45 NTUs. Our next test was salinity, a measurement of sodium content. This salinity did not change after filtration. Another test we do is pH. We opted to use an electric pH sensor rather than pH strips because after trying pH strips, we found that they were inaccurate. Our solution actually became more basic after filtration, going from about six to increasing to eight. Our final test was on TDS, a measurement of total dissolved solids. The TDS actually increased after filtration, which was a problem because we're aiming for a lower number. In conclusion, we cannot reach a conclusion because our TDS and salinity levels were not high enough to uh, the dr uh, safe drinking standard. Towards the end of our research, we started analyzing each layer of our filter in hopes of finding the layer that was the pro caused the problem for TDS. So if we had for time, we would like to replace that layer and run the test again. Another thing we wanted to try was what I mentioned earlier, which was uh, electrospinning our own antibacterial fibers and creating polymer fibers to separate the layers. Thank you for your time, and if you'd like to hear more, you can come meet us in the auxiliary gym. The, uh, next up's firepower. I'm Daniel Gregory. My name is Zachary Klein. And this is Firepower. Firefighting is a very dangerous profession. Firefighters can see a number of different things on a daily basis. Therefore, the clothing that they wear has to be able to withstand anything. 
The current suits that firefighters wear can weigh upwards of 75 pounds. This weight, mixed with the high heat and pressure of a fire, can lead to sudden cardiac events, which account for three out of every five firefighting deaths. If we could find a way to decrease this weight, we could lower this number by a lot. Now, there are current solutions to this problem. Nomex, a product by DuPont on the left there, is in current use. But I think we can improve on it with Banfire. Banfire is a fire retardant liquid spray that is the backbone for our experiments. To begin with Banfire, we wanted to figure out how it fully worked. So we cut out pieces of a cotton t-shirt, things that most people wear on a daily basis. The picture on the left shows a square of cotton t-shirt that does not have Banfire on it. This, within a few seconds of putting a lighter under it, it ignited. The entire thing went away in under a minute. The one on the right, we sprayed with Banfire and let dry for a little bit. When we put it, a lighter right under it, it never caught. The only parts that were affected was the closest part that burned. From this, we can now know that Banfire was really the way to go with our research. After proving its efficiency, the next step was to create a polymer. On the left there is our base, that's 80% deionized water and 20% polyvinyl pyrrolidone, or PVP. On the right is our experimental, that's 80% Banfire and 20% PVP. What we ended up going with was in the middle, uh, a combination. 40% deionized water, 40% Banfire, and 20% PVP. We then threw all three solutions into the electrospinning station and just collected on a flat plate with aluminum foil. These are images of our sample under a microscope. On, on the left is an optical microscope image, and on the right is a scanning electron microscope image, or SEM. This is just a proof of concept to see the fibers in general. You can see the band fire on the right one specifically. While we were able to spin all three polymers, only two of them came thick enough that we were able to peel off of the collection plate. And that was our control with just the deionized water as shown on the left, and our mix of band fire and deionized water shown on the right. When we put a flame under it, it ended up not burning at all. Due to the melting point of the polyvinyl pyrrolidone, it only melted away. So in conclusion of our test, it really was hard to tell whether the band fire had any effect on whether it burned or not. Now, this is disappointing, but spinning band fire to begin with is revolutionary. And I think that can be a backbone for experiments to come. We thank you for your time and like to bring Helix to the stage. Ladies and gentlemen, thank you all for being here. My name is Jada Beach. I'm Emmy Allen. And I'm Nicole Lawson. We are Helix, and we are very excited to share our findings with you. Now, vaccines have been around for several generations, and especially in the previous years, it has caused quite the controversy. But what if I told you that instead of getting a yearly vaccine, we could actually just get a one-and-done shot that eradicates the virus entirely? In the last century, scientific research has shown that viruses and the mutations can be controlled properly with vaccines. Yet COVID-19 has been an outlier of all viruses that have ever existed. It continues to mutate and disregard the effects of the Pfizer and Moderna vaccines. These graphs here show the amount of people that were vaccinated with the COVID-19 vaccine and the amount that were vaccinated and still got COVID. Besides vaccines, there are other solutions being further explored to help with the prevention of disease. With the advance of nanotechnology, it has been incorporated into the medical field. Currently, certain nanoparticles are used in drug and vaccine delivery. Also, nanoparticles have been getting involved with DNA research, with the goal being to either alter DNA or even destroy it. And this is where CRISPR enzyme comes into play. Specifically, CRISPR-Cas13 was an enzyme used to destroy viral DNA and prevent it from spreading. 
CRISPR can be defined as a segment of DNA that contains repetitions of base sequences that can be used to edit the base pair of a gene. Within the science and engineering aspect of our research, we decided to use gel electrophoresis. Now, gel electrophoresis is the process of separating and analyzing DNA. We then wanted to implement nanoparticles into this process, and then we would begin to analyze the difference between our control and our experiment. Now, to really understand what is going on, we have to then see how the fragments travel. So to understand, we have the shorter fragments and the longer fragments. The shorter fragments travel farther, and then the longer fragments travel shorter due to the density difference. And then we also have to understand that the more fragments that travel to the spe specific location, the bands will end up being thicker. And then we can now look at the mutations, which would be the difference between the length, the distance, and the thickness of the bands. The picture on the left is all the materials needed for us to make our own gels for this experiment. This experiment is possible because DNA is negatively charged. When the power supply gets plugged in, the negatively charged DNA begins to migrate to the positive side of the power supply, causing the bands to stretch and allowing us to analyze if the DNA is damaged or not. So we decided to test titanium dioxide and silver nanoparticles because titanium dioxide was used in previous research with DNA damage and silver because of its antibacterial properties. So with the titanium dioxide, we saw a significant difference on DNA migration. After our staining process, we were able to see no bands present. This could also be due to the fact that we used a UV light on the gel because titanium dioxide has a reaction with UV light and we did this in hope to increase the DNA damage. And then with silver, it had the opposite effect. We still saw all the same bands present and they traveled roughly to the same location. The only difference was they were slightly lighter, but we concluded that because after adding nanoparticles, the DNA sample density changed. If we had more time, we would like to work with a weakened virus and be able to damage their DNA, hopefully. And then later, we would also like to further our research on the titanium dioxide nanoparticles and conclude if our results were actually true and being the bands that did not show up. Another idea we had was fluorescence microscopy, which allows you to see a DNA under a microscope, yet this was too far out of our price range. So another idea we recently discovered was a smartphone microscope in which DNA and mutations are also present, so it can help analyze DNA further. Our main goal that we'd like to focus on is using nanoparticles that would actually be safe to inject into our bodies, and we'd also like to do a little more testing on UV light since it has been proven to damage DNA. I want to thank you all for listening. I really appreciate it. And now, let's move on to thermocharge. Good evening, I'm Jack Baylor. I'm Brendan Engling. I'm Liam Barron. I'm Shivan Patel. And we are Thermocharge. As you were on your way here today, you may have noticed that gas is now around 490 a gallon. What if I were to tell you that this is not true, but instead the actual price of gasoline is near 1630 a gallon. Now the reason for this drastic price difference is because the average automobile is only 30% efficient. This means that only 30% of the fuel in your car is turned into usable energy. Much of the remaining 70% of that energy is dissipated as heat. As you can see in this image, this is the car's exhaust manifold, which can reach temperatures as high as 800 degrees Celsius. Currently, all of this thermal energy is going to waste, but what if there's a way we could harness it and return it back to the vehicle? This is where the thermoelectric generator, or the TEG, comes in. The TEG works by creating an electrical output through a temperature difference by utilizing semiconducting materials, the positive P-type and the negative N-type. Our team plans to utilize multiple TEGs onto a hot car exhaust to recover some of the wasted heat energy and repurpose it back into the vehicle. To further understand these devices, our team took a deep dive into microscopy. With most of our samples being within the 500 to 1,000 micron range, the SCM seemed like overkill. What really came through to shine was the EDS feature, which allowed us to capture images like these. What we're looking at here is the N-type material, the negatively charged material, as Shivan touched on earlier, bismuth telluride. This is negatively charged due to its electron structure, which makes up the first series of the link. And on the second series of the link is our P-type material, our positively charged bismuth selenide. This is positively charged due to the holes within its chemical structure and allows for electron transfer when heat is induced 
to in turn create electricity and power our modules. For our first experiment, our team went to design a way to characterize our TEGs. We achieved this by creating a breadboard circuit that integrated three 10 ohm resistors. After passing 10 volts through these resistors, we reached a max surface uh, temperature of 115 degrees Celsius. After placing our TEGs onto this hot surface, we yielded a max power output of only 44 milliwatts, proving that cooling was necessary for further testing. Now that we knew we could generate an output, our next step was implementation. We fabricated a rectangular steel pipe and fastened four TEGs to it to replicate a car's exhaust system. By wiring the TEGs in series and using an air-cooled system, we generated much more voltage than we did with any of our prior experiments. This, however, came with a problem. The temperature, the temperature difference was so high that it generated an electrical current that was too much for the TEGs to handle, shorting the components and rendering them useless. Our new goal was to maintain these high outputs, but also keep the TEGs in a functional range of sustainability. One of the biggest what ifs in our endeavor is what if we had more time. If we had more time, we would have liked to acquire higher quality TEGs and attach them to a fully functioning exhaust system. By doing this, we would generate a power output that could either be stored in the battery bank or returned directly to the vehicle. Increased cooling capability would also help control temperatures to thus increase the voltage produced, which can be re-implemented into the modern vehicle. We'd like to thank you all for your time tonight, and we'd like to introduce TEPIX. Good evening, everyone. My name is John Fister. And I am Dominic Pareka, and we are TEPIX. 70%. 70% of all energy produced is wasted through heat and friction. As you just heard, 70% of all energy produced is wasted as heat. With our global energy demand expected to rise by nearly 50% by the year 2050, it's imperative a new energy source is created. Phase change materials are what come to mind. Phase changing materials, or PCMs, are a substance that, while changing their phase, absorb or release energy to assist with heating or cooling. These, used in conjunction with TEGs, or thermoelectric generators, which take advantage of a difference in temperature to produce energy, and a new energy source can be used. So the first part of our, is the, is the generator, is the apparatus. On top is the heat sink, which we use to diffuse the heat from the TEG. Underneath that is the copper plate, which we use to connect the TEG and the heat sink. Right below that is the TEG, the most important part, and cork, which we use to isolate the hot side and the cold side. Below that is a resistor bank, which we use to heat up the TEG uh, to produce power. We measured all of this using Vernier software and thermocouples and Go Energy sensors. Although we wish they would have been, not all of our experiments were successful. After completing all of our characterization experiments, we began to look through our data. While looking at it, we realized something wasn't right. Looking at it, we realized that our PCTIM gave us half the power output but double the temperature difference. This, obviously not being right, we collaborated with another group to see what was wrong. We realized that we were measuring the temperature in the wrong spot. We had the heat sink, we had the heat couple, the thermocouple inside of the heat sink which after dispersing much of the heat along with the copper plate didn't give us an accurate result of the cold side. So what do we do to fix this? We remove the heat sink and copper plate entirely. We hope that getting rid of the heat dispersing device would make it so that we have a more direct connection to the TEG, therefore we're getting more accurate results. These are the averages of our three TEG runs. On the left is showing time versus temperature, and on the right is time versus power. You can see that as time goes on and a temperature difference is created, that more power is output. This takes the previous two graphs and puts them at the top along with our PCTIM runs at the bottom. And this combines those previous four graphs into two graphs, with the left still showing time versus temperature. And you can see those dotted lines there with the PCTIM gave us a higher power, higher temperature output, but still the same temperature difference as the TEG, and yet gave us half the power output. These results being the same as our first set of experiments, we realized that this is our true solution. 
So m further research must be done into why this is the result. So if we had more time, we would like to test more phase change materials, more phase change inter interface materials, and run as many experiments as we possibly could. This way we can get more accurate results and hopefully find the results we were looking for. Thank you for your time, and I'd like to pass it over to North Penn Thermoelectrics. I'm Russell Cole. I'm Ryan Banya. And we are North Penn Thermoelectrics. Every given reaction loses efficiency through waste heat. Human technology is not exempt from this. However, this is where thermoelectrics comes in. Thermoelectric generators, also known as TEGs, take the heat difference between any two given materials and create voltage out of it. This can be used to harvest uh, the uh, power from any kind of heat difference. So, for our first experiment, we decided to analyze the internal composition of a thermoelectric plate using the Oxford Elemental Analysis on the SEM. Now, we got some good results from this, however, we did discover that there are hazardous materials such as lead and bismuth telluride within the plate. Due to concerns about plate safety, we decided to shift our focus to characterizing the limits of a plate. For our second experiment, we put voltage through a plate to gauge how much temperature it could generate. Experiment three was an attempt to generate power from a heat difference. However, results were inconclusive due to shaky setup. Experiment four was a rerun of experiment two with a significantly more advanced setup, meaning we got better readings. Once we completed characterization of the plate in general, so we knew what, would, what it is and what would happen, we began looking for another material that could solve our problem. So we found graphene. Most of you have probably made this material once or twice while just writing a shopping list. It's a single layer of graphite atoms in such a way that it's extremely strong and thermoelectric, which is what we were looking for. So we found a way to produce it, and once we did that, we placed it on some stubs and put it through the scan electron microscope or the SEM. Once we did that, we found we, have the, uh, we got these beautiful images, which is a comparison of tape and on the aluminum plate itself. When we put the graphene on the aluminum plate, the goal was to try to pull apart the graphite to create it. From there on, we realized that since the graphene on there would be too small to use, we tried to create our own way to produce the material, which brought us to electrospinning. The only thing we really changed on the setup was to add a minute amount of graphite powder into our solution, along with PEO, along with shortening the distance. Once we did that, we realized that when it came out, it more formed into a messy structure, another way to put it. When we tossed it into the SEM and took a look at it, we realized that the graphite more clumped together and became unusually and un mostly unusable. From there, we realized it was the end of the year and we decided doing some more research to help future teams. So towards the end of our research, we discovered the material bismuth selenide. It is thermoelectric and is not toxic, which is important due to the earlier materials being, well, fairly hazardous to human beings. Now, it is extremely expensive to produce at the moment and almost does not occur naturally. However, it is a good avenue for further research. And with that, we would like to hand it off to Concussion Tech. Good evening, I'm Alan Joby. And I'm Dev Vias, and this is Concussion Tech. 
So according to the CDC, 3.8 million sports-related concussions occur every year in the U.S. In case you don't know what a concussion is, it happens when a hit to the head or body causes your head and brain to move rapidly back and forth. Even though there's only a 0.3% mortality rate for concussions, people with multiple concussions are more likely to have long-term cognitive impairment and emotional struggles such as depression, uncontrolled anger, and memory loss. Current NFL helmets are tested with this battering ram as shown in the left image. These are primarily designed to reduce skull fractures with direct and linear hits, and that's why they're still failing to prevent concussions today. So the first thing we needed to do was find a way to impact test materials. We tried using a vernier force plate, which you can see on the left, and an Arduino, which you can see on the right. But they both turned out to be outdated, inconsistent, and inaccurate. Thankfully, we were able to find these vernier force carts. With these, you can find position, velocity, acceleration, time, and force. This is how we had all of our experiments set up. We had a six-foot track on a decline with two carts on either side and our material or polymer that we electrospun in the middle. So we were able to get an input and an output force between the two carts. After we found a way to impact tests, we needed a material to test. So through lots of research, we determined that PMMA was the best material to electrospin. It's mostly used in shatterproof windows and bone cement, and overall it's just a very impact resistant material. This is what our PMMA pad looked like under the SEM before impact tests. As you can see, it's kind of in a webbed formation. These were our test results that we got. And as you can see on the left, with no protection between the two carts, we were able to get an average of 17.5 newtons of force. And we were able to bring it down to 8.6 with our best performing materials, which was PMMA and sorbethane. So we were able to approximately absorb 51% of our initial force. And this was our PMMA after our test. As you can see, it's broken down and scattered compared to the web formation that we had earlier. So if we had more time, we would like to make a thicker pad of PMMA because our PMMA pad was only about an inch thick. Our next step would be to encapsulate PMMA with another material so that it doesn't break down over time. We'd also like to electrospin and impact test other polymers, and we'd also like to look into materials that older groups have had success with. Thank you for your time, and now we'd like to hand it off to Ware. Hello, my name is Jennifer Denning. And I'm Justin Kwok. And I'm Sanaf Thoda. We are we're aware. aware. So currently, uh, prices for copper have been on the rise recently. On the left is a graph from 1988 to 2021. There's been a peak of 100% increase in the copper prices. As you all know, copper prices, or copper in general, is deeply intertwined with our society and a key component for standard wires. Uh, our research is focused on trying to find like more effective uses for this or just completely re replacing it. So some current uh, solutions is a team from MIT named Wittricity. Uh, they discovered a technique called magnetic uh, resonance coupling and that uh, allows them to magnetically or wireless, uh, wirelessly transfer electricity. And on the right here, there's a picture of more uh, frequent, uh, recent uh, endeavors they've been working on is a car battery charger through the floor wirelessly. All right, so how exactly does a magnetic resonance coupling works? It works using something called an uh, alternating current, and this is created when the charge goes between positive and negative. That change in charge creates a magnetic field which allows you to transfer energy wirelessly, but the problem with this is that it's extremely inefficient. So our goal with this was to find the best ratio of coils. We did this by testing a 20, 30, and 40 coil combination through the transistor and corresponding receiver, and with this we measured the LED output. This is how we primarily collected data. We connected a LUX sensor to an Arduino board. LUX is a unit of light. It's used to measure how much light is in an exact area. And using this LUX sensor, we could connect it to an LED, which was connected to the coil system, 
which would measure the amount of power running through that system. With the help of Mr. Daubert, we 3D printed a box to house our lock sensor. We did this because the lock sensor is extremely sensitive to changes in the environment, such as the light in the room that we were conducting the experiment in and us moving around doing the experiment, and this would discredit our data. So we did this just to control our experiment and make sure that our results were only from the LED output. As you see on the left, this is a close up of how the inside of the box would work. The lid is taken off just for better clarity, but we would put it on just to remove any extraneous light. There is a set distance between where the LED would enter in the bottom and where the lux sensor is housed on the top. And we would, that of course controlled the amount of light that would travel along that distance. On the right, there is the whole setup of what our experiment looked like. There is a power source connected to a coil, which is transmitting power to another coil, which is connected to an LED. That LED, of course, goes inside the box and uh, gives power, gives light to the lux sensor. This is a graph of how our data would primarily look. We didn't use the graphs exactly to get data, but it's just a better way to visualize. We use the output of the actual um, lux sensor, which would give us precise numerical values. And as you see, as soon as the LED was put in the lux sensor box, or it was the LED was turned on, it gave a sharp incline and then a relative plateau where the value, the actual power, the um, the actual power of the coil will be shown. This is the data we collected from our experiment. There is some variance due to extraneous light entering the box, try as we did, but you, there is some clear trends you can see in this data. This is a graph of the total amount of lux, um, the total amount of lux for a ratio, and the actual no total number of returns for a ratio. As you see, 20 receiver by 30 transmitter had the most amount of lux um, running through, the most had the highest amount of lux, while the 40 transmitter by receiver had the lowest amount of lux unexpectedly. So if we had more time, we'd change the material composition of our wires, because while it was copper, uh, there was more conductive metals that may give more better results, like silver or gold. Uh, we definitely, uh, uh, there's some inconsistent um, like problems we ran into with transistors where they would stop like, working all of a sudden and we have to replace them. We'd look into that more, and we also ran an experiment on frequency, but we ran out of time due to constraints, so. And we'd also uh, like to further research on oscillation, which is uh, how uh, frequency is developed. Thank you, we'd like to pass on the hydro optimize. Hello, my name is Josh Platt. I'm Ethan Beck. And I'm Chris LaRosa. And we are Hydroptimize. Hydrogen has an extraordinary potential as a clean alternative fuel source, but it is rarely found by itself in diatomic form. Now, while its use does not result in carbon emissions, its extraction almost always comes from fossil fuels. Here on Earth, hydrogen is most commonly found in water, but only 0.1% of the world's hydrogen fuel comes from water. In order to get the diatomic hydrogen that we need from water, we must run a process called electrolysis. This is when you run an electric current through a source of water and then splitting apart the atomic bonds to break the individual elements into their indiv elemental parts, creating diatomic hydrogen and diatomic oxygen. We can then run the reaction in the opposite direction where we pump the hydrogen gas into a proton exchange membrane. This catalyst will then react with the hydrogen, stripping the electrons off. The electrons will then flow through the circuit while the hydrogen nucleus will pass through the membrane. They will then recombine on the opposite side and then recombine with oxygen gas to create pure water. We begin our characterization by running a couple fuel th cells through a circuit containing two multimeters to measure voltage and current. We would then use the data to graphically represent the power output of the fuel cells through a power curve. This is the SAE International Fuel Cell. This is the first fuel cell we worked with. We chose to dissect and analyze the PEM from this fuel cell under our SEM because it was the worst functioning fuel cell and we wouldn't miss it much. Up next, we have the Project Lead the Way fuel cell. The fuel cell is first used to run electrolysis. The gas is collected at the top of the bottom chamber, displacing the water up through a tube into the top chamber. It is then run back through as the fuel cell 
the water going back down to the tube, pushing the gas up back to the PEM. Displayed here are five power curves that we created with the fuel cell. It generally produced between 60 and 80 milliwatts of power. And finally, we have the rebuildable HTEC fuel cell. We would use this fuel cell to then test our own PEM because it was rebuildable. The, the PEM included in this fuel cell is actually very productive and efficient, as demonstrated by the top left graph. So in order to find a little bit more disparity in its power, we altered the resistance in the circuit. And then we have the PEM that is inside the SAE International fuel cell. We own an elemental analysis to see what components made up the, the PEM. We found that there's a high concentration of platinum and iridium alloy, which are highly catalytic metals, but also very expensive, making the entire system very expensive. With characterization complete, we can now begin attempts to produce a membrane of our own. To do this, we turn to electrospinning. To produce our membrane, we selected polycaprolactone, as it is not water soluble and would therefore not dissolve in our fuel cell. We also chose to embed metal nanoparticles into our membrane as the active ingredient to facilitate the conversion of hydrogen. In this SEM image, you might be able to see those embedded metal nanoparticles as they appear as bright white dots due to their conductivity under the SEM. Here we have another EDS image of that same PEM fuel cell that we created ourselves. Shown by the different colors are the locations of each of the silver and copper nanoparticles embedded within the PCL fibers. With electrospinning complete, we can now begin to test our membrane. First, we sandwiched our membrane in between two pieces of carbon paper, which prevented water from contacting the membrane. We could then install this into our fuel cell. As you can see by the bottom right image, our PEM was able to produce hydrogen and oxygen gas, but the concentration of copper and silver nanoparticles was not high enough to produce a measurable amount of hydrogen that we could then run back to the characterization circuit. If we had more time, we would attempt to spin another PCL membrane with a higher concentration of silver nanoparticles, and then also run the same membrane with another concentration of platinum nanoparticles to then test the catalytic properties of the silver and see if it was comparable for our research. Thank you very much, and we would like to pass it off to Piezoelectrics. My name is Abigail Thornton. I'm Justin Norn. I'm Dylan Scher. I'm Greg Hartwig. And we are Piezoelectrics. So I have a question for the audience. By a show of hands, who has used a computer before? Did you know that the average person types about 200 characters per minute? Now what if you can generate electricity through the tips of your fingers each time you press a key? Energy harvesting is taking the energy in an environment system and converting it into an electric power. Examples of this are solar, wind, thermoelectric, and piezoelectric energy. But what is piezoelectric energy? It's when you take the impact force or vibration of an object and convert it into an electrical charge. These pictures show our first time electrospinning. Electrospinning is a process we use to make the PVDF piezoelectric material. So the two photos at the top show an electrospun sample of PVDF with a molecular weight of 180K, and the two bottom photos show a 534K sample. We decided to go with the 534K sample because it had a higher um, output through informal testing and it had much clearer SEM imaging. So we decided to use the keyboard because it was widely used around the world, easily able to acquire for testing and practical in the working world. During our research, we were actually the first team to get the chance to use the Tormach 770M, which is also known as the CNC machine. Now, this was done with the help of Dr. Wojciech and the North Penn Educational Foundation. We used the CNC machine to mill out a mold for us to electrospin on. But in practice, the nanofibers started tenting over the buttons, so we had to ask the help of Mr. Daubert to 3D print a 
3D print a female counterpart for us in order to compress the nanofibers into the desired shape. These photos show the first time electrospinning onto the mold and then compressing with the female counterpart. From this piezoelectric tab, we got around 6.4 millivolts per tap on a direct hit. For PX09, we electrospun three layers of PVDF onto our aluminum mold, and then afterwards we compressed it with our 3D printed female part. We put this into the keyboard, but it did not operate very well. PX10A was a single layer and flat compared to PX09. It generated an average of 23.8 millivolts per tap with the keyboard mat, which made it more sensitive and durable. For PX11, we electrospun three layers of PVDF onto a flat aluminum collection plate, and we tried different solutions to try to maximize our voltage output. Some of our solutions were spacers in between the keys, soldered connections, and different data collectors with less resistance. And some of our more successful solutions were copper tape to improve connections and a soft keyboard mat. To conclude our research, we did a final tap test on PX-10A with the goal of charging a capacitor. So once we were sure that the capacitor could hold and store our charge, we would transmit it into a portable battery. We had gotten up to one volt, but then we realized we needed five to transmit. So then when we got up to three volts, it was great, but then we realized that the capacitor was bleeding out the charge faster than we could generate it. All in all though, this experiment was incredibly successful because not only were we able to generate voltage through our piezoelectric keyboard and store it within a capacitor, but we were to do all this while the keyboard was fully functional. So if we had more time with our experiment and research, we would work on making a larger piezoelectric tab that covers the entire keyboard. Um, we would work on a tab that generates more voltage on every tab. All right. And thank you all. Now on to Nanomed. Hello, my name is Serena Diartha. I'm Matthew Pettigone. And I'm Emily Blanchard. And we are Nanomed. The leading cause of death in the world is cardiovascular disease. Cardiovascular disease is largely tied to cardiac health, which is linked to amounts of LDL cholesterol. The second highest cause of death is cancer. The solution to these diseases are bile acid sequestrants and statins for cholesterol, and typically a type of chemotherapy is prescribed to cancer patients. These both can cause severe side effects in for specifically for statins and bile acid sequestrants. They can cause severe damage to the liver and kidneys, and chemotherapy can regularly, regularly target uh, healthy cells, which can cause hair loss, nausea, and even death sometimes. Now, what if these medicines didn't target areas they weren't supposed to? They only targeted the areas where they were meant to be activated. That is the primary idea of targeted drug delivery and the focus of our research this year. To begin understanding targeted drug delivery, we repeated a past teams experiment which micro-encapsulated yeast and naproxen with sodium alginate and calcium chloride. The result of these experiments were these gel-like beads which contained yeast and naproxen respectively. To characterize our encapsulation, we used the Zeiss microscope and the SEM. We first took images of the individual, individual components we were looking for, yeast and naproxen, so we could later identify them within the final product. The image on the right is of a cut open one of the yeast beads we created. The darker spots we believe to be clumps of yeast cells. Here at 1,000 times magnification, on the left you can see um, a glowing clump of yeast cells, on, while on the right, on a more zoomed out view, you can see how those um, glowing clumps are spread out through the surface of the bead. At first we thought each individual yeast cell would be um, encapsulated in a shell of sodium algae and calcium chloride. What we found is said that um, the yeast was dispersed throughout the larger bead. To test our encapsulation, we used a pH test. Because naproxen has a higher pH than water, we can know whether or not it's leaking out, whether the solution becomes more basic over time. We first used um, pH paper strips to test um, the solution. We found them to be mostly inaccurate, so we started to use the vernier pH sensor. 
The graph on the bottom left shows how for six hours, the pH of our solution stayed around seven, which is normal for water, before the beads began to break down and the solution became more basic. This shows how our encapsulation was initially successful. All right, so at this point in our research, we have decided to go down the path of magnetic drug delivery. And in this, a substance of our choice is able to be magnetically maneuvered to a specific point in the body, thus not eradicating throughout the entire body system. To start this process out, we had to create what's called MPVA, or magnite polyvinyl alcohol. I know, it's a mouthful. To start this out, we had to get magnite, which is gonna be the um, magnetic component of our particle, and bake it with polyvinyl alcohol, which acts as one half of a sticky substance to, create, to keep the substance of our choice connected to that iron. So in the top middle picture, you can see that eventually we got this process to be successful. And then in a separate beaker, we combined together photochromic dye and dimethyl sulfoxide, or DSMO. DSMO can really easily bind to that polyvinyl alcohol. And we chose photochromic dye, which can be interchanged with naproxen or any other drug of our choice, just because of its characterization abilities, which is what we're gonna see in a few slides. And then we combined this with ZLDH, which created a shell around it to then cure it in sodium hydroxide. And here we can just see a cross section of the layers of the bead. In the middle we have that magnite polyvinyl alcohol surrounded by the photochromic dye, dimethyl sulfoxide, and then the shell of ZLDH and cured in sodium hydroxide. In the end, our experiment was very successful after many renditions, as you can see in this video. The particle was very responsive to the magnet on the outside of the beaker, and as you can see, in a UV light or a black light, photochromic dye actually glows in a red hot pink color, which is what we can see in that image all the way to the far left. We can also see that the photochromic dye did not escape into the surrounding environment, which is really good because that means that the photochromic dye stayed in a bead. Throughout our last experiment, we, used, we took images using the Zeiss microscope and the SEM imaging device. In the middle, top middle image, you can see the nice sheets that were created when we baked the PVA with the magnetic nanoparticles. Those sheets are what interact with the dimethyl sulfoxide and the photochromic dye. In the rest of the SEM images, you can see the final product and see how the other chemicals build around the magnetic nanoparticle. In the images on the left, you can see the same phenomena, but in color. If we had more time, we would have repeated our final experiment with a more refined process while replacing the photochromic dye with naproxen to better fulfill our medicinal um, purpose. Uh, we would also look into release methods rather than just magnetic drug tar targeting. I would like to thank you all for coming out and thank you for watching. We hope to see you in the auction in a few minutes. And please welcome Mr. Boyer back to the stage. Wow. <laughs> Congratulations, seniors, for presenting your work, stage six of the research you guys have done this year. And thank you, audience, for uh, watching along as they were able to share their research they have done. So think about this, when we started in September, wow, the amount of growth that we've had with these teams and just figuring out, first of all, what are our research endeavors gonna do? How are we gonna improve the human condition? The entire goal of, of an engineer is to figure out how to make the world a better place, right? And you take a look at the endeavors they've started on. I cannot wait to see what's next for them, for each and every single one of these students and what the, the future holds for them. All I know is that the work they've done this year is absolutely amazing, and I am truly honored and thankful to be a part of the ride with you guys this year. So I'd like to congratulate our seniors for all the work they had done. And if I can get the seniors to come up here, and actually, if you guys could stand up on the stage and just kind of line up on the front. I know I originally said on the floor, but if you guys can get up here, I would like to get a group shot quickly of all the seniors and only take a minute. While they're coming up, and you guys can stand along the front of the stage here, um, the second half of our evening is, is down in the uh, auxiliary gym, and all of the teams have their things set up. 
Do you guys want to stay down the bottom? I was going to say come up on the stage, but I guess it's going to stay at the bottom then. We're going to be in the second half of the audit um, this evening in the auxiliary gymnasium where you can actually meet them one to one and ask them questions about their research. They have, we have demonstrations set up. There's also some snacks down there if you're interested. And uh, that'll wrap up our evening. So we're going to take a few pictures here for anybody that wants them, and then we'll head down to the auxiliary gymnasium very shortly. So again, thank you very much.